I would like to think I did it professionally back then. She's <laughs> worth that's okay. But I did notice she had the risk management guy in front of me. There you so go. Was managing risk. All right, we got one last giveaway. Jim didn't tell me we're going to give away books. All right, I have a book out there. The title is Anchor Up. We're going to give away a copy of Anchor Up today. I'll give you my business card. The winner of this trivia question puts their name and address, and I'll send you a copy of my book. All right. I know we, we get into nicknames at Vosca Conference as well. Grand Valley State of the Lakers, that's not the trivia question. I went to high school in Pettisville, Ohio, a town of 400 people, graduated with a class of 52. We were the Blackbirds. I already know who's going to win this trivia question. Name the one college out there who was also the nickname the Blackbirds. Uh, Christopher got first. LIU Brooklyn. Who is combining with LIU Post, right? Yep. I'm hoping they'll change their nickname, so I'm the only guy out there. I didn't say it. Did you say it? Who said it? I didn't say it. I didn't say oh, it. Oh, no. yeah? Who said it? Was, was it behind me? <laughs> Who it said it? Front. It was up front. It was Brock. Brock, there you. All right. From the Peacocks to the Blackbirds, baby. <laughs> I've been to Fayette Iowa. Anybody ever been there? Go to the bar. What's in that bar with the tea? Yeah, great roasted chicken. I'm telling you, I've got to go there. It's awesome. All right, so let me, as Jim said, some of you in here are athletics directors. Some want to be, some may not want to be. I hope to give you some uh, uh, views. I, you're probably going to hear everything you've heard so far in the last day and a half, but maybe I'll give it to you from the viewpoint of the AD. And those that uh, maybe never want to be an AD, maybe get you into the brains of your AD a little bit and help you out in, in your role, whatever you do at your school. <coughs> so let me talk about the role of the uh, AD in external affairs, and let me tell my story. So I became the director of athletics at Grand Valley in July or March of 1996. Prior to that, I spent eight years as the associate athletics director at the University of Toledo. That was my alma mater. Played basketball there, got both my degrees there, coached basketball there, and for eight years I was an AD there. And I was the internal guy. I was, uh, in today's vernacular, I would be the deputy AD, okay? I uh, had all the men's sports, I had all the facilities, I had compliance. For those compliance folks out there, yeah, I did all that, all right, back in the day. And it was a great experience for me. But I was there to help solve all the problems internally. Our athletics director was Al Bull. He was very external, so I learned a lot from Al during that time. Even though I didn't do a whole lot externally, I did learn a lot from Al. Our marketing director at the time was a guy named Mike Caravan, and he, we were ahead of the game at Toledo. Uh, in the early 80s with sponsorships and packaging things together and promotions, Mike was ahead of the game. This is almost 40 years ago now, right? And I learned from Mike. So when I went to be the AD at Grand Valley, when I went to interview, I knew Grand Valley, like every school out there, wanted the AD to be a fundraiser. They wanted an AD that could raise funds. Okay, now that I'm consulting, every president out there wants an athletics director that can raise money. Most of them have no idea how to do it. They think you're all going to go out magically, get somebody to give you millions of dollars, and it'll come to athletics. The translation of that is, they want an athletics director that will go out and generate some revenue from the athletics department such that the institution doesn't have to give you as much, okay? Every president wants that. And I go to Grand Valley in 1996, that's what they wanted. And I knew that's what they wanted, so I prepared marketing, promotion, fundraising plan for Grand Valley State when I went in on my interview. And I based it on everything we were doing at Toledo. That's where I learned. And so I didn't have any real experience with it other than in recruiting. How many here have coached at the collegiate level? Okay, good number. All right, y'all have recruited. That's fundraising. That's developing relationships. Same skills that are needed in fundraising. So I get to Grand Valley 1996. Yesterday you heard from Angela, my good friend here from Saginaw Valley, the other valley. Okay. <laughs> A week from Saturday we're going to have the Battle of the Valleys, Grand Valley versus Saginaw Valley. And she's wearing Grand Valley colors today, so somebody get a picture of us. <laughs> Hashtag Saginaw Valley Cardinals, all right? But like her school, our school, we were the two youngest in the state of Michigan, of the 15 publics. 
And uh, 1996 Grand Valley was only about 35 years old. We didn't have any alums to speak of. Certainly none that hit their peak earning years. None of our old alums had money. They were all teachers. And so seeking alumni donations was going to be a time and energy at that point that was going to not be a good use of my time as director of athletics. Fast forward another 10, 15 years. We got to be about 50 years old. Our enrollment started going like this. And we started to get more alumni. Our alumni started to get older. That's when we had to engage our alumni. That's when we went to a similar plan as Karen just discussed with you on Alumni Challenge Program. I'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. All right. But in 1996, our way to generate revenue immediately was we did have businesses. And our way was through sponsorships. And the first uh, uh, hire I made was a marketing and promotions director to go out and sell sponsorships and get butts in the seats and, and jack up our attendance. Okay? Salary and commission. And if you're going to hire a, a person to do that, I highly recommend a salary and a commission. Uh, uh, that's what we had at Toledo. I brought it to Grand Valley, and believe me, it works. Okay? I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But that was the scene when I got to Grand Valley in 1996. We had the Irwin Club. Irwin was Chuck Irwin. That was our first athletics director. That was our fundraising arm for intercollegiate athletics, and they, we weren't doing much at all. In 1996, we were hardly getting many donations, a few parents, a few older alums that you know, give us uh, $50 maybe. It was, it was hardly anything organized, and, and so that was my job to help get that role. Now, the other thing that I would tell you about the role of the AD in this whole external affairs is one of the most important things is the AD has to be committed to it. You've got to make a commitment that we're going to do this. We're going to go out and generate more revenue for athletics at this school, and we're going to go out and increase attendance, and we're going to get our students excited, and we're going to bring people in, and we're going to help uh, ratchet up the interest in intercollegiate athletics at our institution. That takes a commitment. And many people are like me. They may come up through the internal ranks. That's okay. Develop your skills, but you've got to make a commitment. <clears throat> And fast forward to uh, about year 10, I was at Grand Valley of the 20 years. I was director of athletics, by the way. And about year 10, uh, again, I had to make a commitment that we, now we needed to go engage our alumni. Now they were getting old. Now they were getting up significant numbers. And we had to engage them, one alum at a time, if possible, okay? And I had to make that commitment. And I sat down with my staff, and I had a veteran staff at the time, which really helped. And they're, they're terrific. And most of them are still there today doing a great job. Um, I sat down with them and said, listen, I'm mentally geared up for this. And I'm, that means I'm going to be gone more. That means, and I've prepared my life. Hey, we're going to be going out for more dinners. We're going to be doing things. We need to start uh, engaging our alumni and start seeking larger gifts and so on. So it starts with a commitment, okay? Mentally, you've got to commit to this. Let me take a step back first, okay? Jim McComas was president at Toledo when I was there. One of the presidents that we had. The only good one that we had, okay? He was outstanding. And he had this statement. You don't develop external support until you develop a pride from within. And I heard this was mentioned yesterday afternoon. This is so true. You have to develop a pride from within. It starts from within. So today, in my job as a consultant, uh, I've developed a leadership development program that I work directly with athletics directors and his or her staffs, and I, I, I bring uh, uh, mentoring, professional mentoring, I might add, it's professional gym, okay, <laughs> to the school. I bring it to them and do that work with an AD and his or her staff over a two-year period, okay? And in doing that, I always tell them, it starts from within. Everything starts from within. It starts with the people you surround yourself with, with and the culture you develop from within. And in intercollegiate athletics, when you talk about success, this is that college competition, folks. We're talking about competitive success to a large degree. And you've got to work and do things. What can we do to help our teams be more successful, be more competitively successful, okay? And develop in a culture of doing it the right way. It takes hard work. It takes a lot of time, a lot of energy. And the one thing you're going to hear from me, and I think this is true in anything you're talking about in the last two days, 
that commitment that the AD makes, everybody, it's a long-term commitment. You have to think long-term in all of these things. Build a program, whether it's a soccer program or a fundraising program or a sponsorship program, build a program that will last, that will be sustainable time year after year after year after year after year. Okay? One hit wonders in anything don't generally stand the test of time. So what I'm talking about are things that stand the test of time, build a program. And it starts from within. Everything starts from within an athletics department. And then the folks on the outside will see what you have from within and they'll be more supportive. Okay? So when we're talking about revenue generation, first thing I would tell all of you in the room, at the non-division one level, the biggest fundraising you'll ever do is internally. Most of your athletics budgets are 80 to 90 percent institutionally funded. Am I right? Most of us in this room, your athletics budget are a high percentage institutionally funded. So where's the big nut? In funding for you, that institutional pot of money. So you have to develop relationships with everybody from the president and his or her cabinet and the folks that control the institutional funding. That's fundraising. Okay? That's what I went after right away. I knew. We are very fortunate in Grand Valley. We get excellent support from our community and we generate a good amount of revenue externally. 80% of our budget is still institutionally funded. Whether it's tuition or student fees or however it's funded at your school, it's institutionally funded. So some of your biggest donors, quote unquote donors, are the folks that work on your campus. You need to work on those folks. Here's another thing. I'm glad we're live so not every president of the country will see this, okay? <laughs> you need to find out what percent of the institution's budget your athletics department budget is. Know that number, okay? Let me tell you why. Last week, I'm at a D3 school. I'm meeting with the CFO. And I ask, what? by the way, one-third of their student body are student athletes. How many of you can relate to that? We're about one-third or so. Uh, some of you may even be more, OK? One-third of the student body, student athletes. So I ask her, what, what percent of the institutional budget is your athletics budget? Hmm, I don't know. I've never, never, never found out. Let me look. And she goes on banner. And, does this, and she calls one of her underlings and gets back to her, and pretty soon she prints out this thing, 5%, okay? 5% of the institution's entire budget is the intercollegiate athletics budget. That's probably true at most of the schools, somewhere in that ballpark, okay? Third of their student body, they get 5% of the budget, and everybody on the campus complains about how much athletics gets. Are you kidding me? You can't get better bang for your buck. At Grand Valley, is 2.5%. Now, we have a bigger, bigger school and bigger institutional budget. And, we, and I'm talking about the money that the institution gives the athletics budget. Not how much you spend every year from the money you raise. Just what, what they commit, okay? There's 2.5%. I, I reminded everybody of that every year. When I updated my strategic plan annually, it, that was on early in the report. That intercollegiate athletics at Grand Valley State University only encompasses 2.5% of the institution's budget, and this school is getting great bang for its buck for intercollegiate athletics, and I would argue you all could probably make that argument. So I encourage you to do that. I think we need to do that more and more and more. All right? Especially some of you folks who are a student body comprises a good amount of the institution's student body. All right? And in some cases, if athletics went away, the school would be in trouble financially, right? So I would make that argument all day long. Find out what that percent is. And it may not, maybe a little higher than that. That's okay. That's okay. You know, they're getting great bang for their buck in their collegiate athletics and higher ed. And I'll uh, go to my grave arguing that all day long. All right, so back to this point. So here's the three areas besides internally, all right, your biggest fundraising, ticket sales, sponsorships, and fundraising, okay? How many of you are at athletics programs at which most of your events, you do not charge admission. I mean, come on, raise your hand. All right, a good amount of hand. All right. 
And I, I, I appreciate in some cases it's logistically really difficult to do that. The facility's not set up right. You don't have a fence with a gate and all that sort of thing. We have a similar situation in baseball and softball. When it came to postseason, though, we roped it off. And if I wish I had to do it over again, I'd have roped it off every game. I'd have made everybody pay for every game. I believe that's critical. I think, I don't care what level you're at, D2, D3, NAI, JUCO, it doesn't matter. I think that you should be charging admission for every event that you possibly can. So the argument I get is, well, we won't even make enough money to pay for uh, the ticket takers. <clears throat> you should, first of all, okay? And by the way, I never charge the home team's parents. By NCA rules, they get four comp admissions, fine, we give them. Never charge your own students. Students pay for intercollegiate athletics to all of our schools. They get them free. But I would argue that those kids put in all that time and effort, there's a value on that. So somebody should pay it a dollar amount for the, the effort those kids and those coaches put in. Are you kidding me? Uh, name the sport, swimming and diving? Absolutely. Right? They swim every morning, they swim every afternoon. You mean you can't get people to pay five or ten bucks for that swimming? You bet. You know what they do when they go to high school events? <laughs> hey, all of them. I was a parent of three kids, trust me, I know. All right? I would argue for every event you possibly can. So I was at school last week, volleyball match, Wednesday night. Mostly students there, right? And so the next day, how much you take in at the gate? Now, barely enough to cover the ticket takers. And what about those four parents from the visiting team? Yeah. They kind of snuck in before we were set up, okay, <laughs> right? But I would argue in a world of scarce resources, and you live in a world of scarce resources in higher ed today, that every dollar amount you take in is helpful to you. If you cover the cost of one official, okay, yeah, they're paying like 145 for one volleyball official, D3, is that right? For, man, a lot. All they do is stand there, blow the whistle and wait. <laughs> no. So, if, but if you can make the cost to cover one official, guess what? You just save your budget, 145 bucks. All right? And then for some of those bigger games, you can do a little better. So be it. You're not going to make money. It's like a net money. You're not going to be D1 like. You're not going to, you know. But at, over time, if you're working at generating attendance and getting more and more people at your events, okay? Believe me, they aren't going to complain about paying. They're not. They're used to paying at the high school events. I, we, we never got one complaint about paying. Okay? So I would encourage that. That's one thing. Okay. And then, of course, sponsorships and fundraising. Move on. You're going to give me a signal when I'm getting up to. All right. Okay. All right. So the importance of it. Why? Again, to help save your operations budget every dime you can. That's critical. It's every dollar you can. It's critical in our levels of college athletics. You've got to do that, okay? So the other reason that I think it's critical that you are working really hard at external affairs, sponsorships, fundraising, your student athletes and your coaches uh, deserve it, and they'll appreciate it. They need to know the athletics director is working at that. They need to know you're going to bat for them. I've been on 18 college campuses since I uh, retired as AD in July of 2016. Okay, so I've seen a wide range here of external affairs uh, commitment. All right, and one of the schools, uh, and when I go to school, by the way, I like to visit with the SAC, Student Athlete Advisory Council. It tells me about an athletics program. You can't fool kids, man. They, they give you the answers, right? And one of them, it was apparent that they knew they knew their school wasn't doing anything in any of these areas. They go to visiting teams, they see signage, they see stuff being given away, they see, you know, uh, media, they see all that stuff. And at their place, none of it was being done. All right? And clearly, they didn't feel that the leadership in their department was going to bat for them. So that's one reason right there. Besides the fact, the importance of it is that, besides help save every dollar you can in your operations budget. All right? All right, so what are some of the skills? As an AD, as any of you, 
All right, this is not rocket science here. All right, you gotta love people. You gotta love people. Develop relationships with people. This is what the whole thing's about. Getting people excited about the kids in your program. Okay. You gotta be visible on and off campus. This is where, as the AD, the time commitment really comes in, because you have to be there. You have to be there. That was a phrase I used with my staff all that. Be there. Be there. Just be there. And you've got to go to everything on campus and off. And remember, on campus, your biggest fundraiser and our levels of college athletics is going to be internally. It's going to be internally. Be at the art building opening. Be at the library something or other, OK? Be there at whatever university, social club, event kind of thing you have at your school. Be there. Be seen. All right, don't set up that athletics at Grand Valley. Uh, it's the folks over in the field house on the other side of the street. Main campus drive went here. All the athletic stuff was here. It's all those folks on the other side of the street. Well, I don't want that. Well, in order to change that, we had to go across the street. So I would go to all these events, and I'd drag people with me. Once in a while, I had a coach had a little extra time, I'd take a coach with me. Brian Kelly. Is Notre Dame's head football coach. He was our head football coach for 13 years. He coached the Grand Valley 17 years. He was always willing to do that stuff. He'd go with me to anything I asked him to that I thought I needed to do that. Talking about the role of the coach, that's how you can engage them. They're the rock stars on your campus. Engage them. All right? Some are better rock stars than others, but engage them. That's why Brian's so great at Notre Dame. At Notre Dame, you better be able to engage people outside of that flex. And he can do that. He can coach and win football games, and he can do that. So you've got to uh, uh, take athletics to the other folks on campus. Don't wait for them to come to you. You go to them. You win over those people, OK? And, and again, developing relationships, just like you would in recruiting. For those of you that are coach, same thing, all right? Develop that relationship. Thank people all the time. I think I heard that yesterday. You can never thank people enough. Never thank people enough. Every opportunity you get in front of a group that's been supportive of you, thank them. Internally or off campus, thank them. So I'm going to talk about our version of, uh, Karen just talked about her program. We had a similar version. Many of you probably have. Um, and next I'm going to talk about working with the Advancement Development Office, but it applies here about thanking people all the time. So it took me three years at Grand Valley uh, to get our folks in our development office to help us come up with a system of when somebody makes a gift at Grand Valley, we needed to send them a reminder letter the next year that it's time for their gift to their own club. Doesn't seem like a, uh, a big thing to do. It took us three years to accomplish it. Okay? I don't understand why the software we had couldn't figure that out. But it took us three years. I, I'm a graduate of the University of Toledo, a member of the Rocket Club. Every year they'd send me a letter. Uh, last year you sent us X amount for the Rocket Club. Thank you for that. We appreciate that. It's now time for you to make your gift for the Rocket Club again this year. Fine. Write checks, send them in. If I don't get that reminder, believe me, I was a busy guy. I would have three months ago <coughs> thought, geez, I haven't given a gift. And I had people coming to me. You know, I'm not sure if I've given the Irwin Club yet this year. All right, well, let's set up a system and get them to do that. So we finally got that set up. And then we finally got set up that, OK, in every month, they get the reminder letter from me. I'd send them around. And it was a form letter, and I'd write a personal letter at the bottom all of them. And if it was a uh, uh, track and field uh, alum, I'd circle the part. Uh, our SID would come up with good stuff to put in this letter. And I'd circle the part of track and field and cross country. And, and they'd love that, right? they remind them. It's time for their gift. Then when they give a gift, Thank you letter from me, thank you letter from the coach. Okay, I encouraged our coaches, send a thank you letter. Doesn't have to be anything special. Send them a thank you letter, somewhere on there, put a personal handwritten note of some sort so they know you appreciate the gift. And then guess what? You'll get that gift again next year. And then you'll get it the next year. And then you'll get it the next year. That's what you have, that's long-term thinking, okay? And as Karen said, I had some coaches that were really good at that, and some, not as good, the ones that are really good at, started bringing some serious dollars, okay? Only because they thanks people. Okay. Listen. Key, key element here. 
in, in this, especially for the AD. Listen. Listen. <coughs> when, when you meet with people and you develop those, just listen. Listen to what they have to say. We had the, we're generating money right now uh, for to renovate and expand our football center at Grand Valley. It's 20 years old. The uh, uh, when we first built this, we sold lockers for a thousand a pop, and they get paid over four years. And Brian Kelly and I got in a car, and we drove to Detroit, and we met with all of our Detroit area alums two and a half hours away, and it's downtown bar in downtown Detroit, and it was dark as all get out in the daytime. This is bright daylight, we're down there. And we have this rah-rah rally, and we got 12 guys to sign up for a locker at 1,000 apiece. And we were in the parking lot high five and afterwards. 12,000, okay? Brian, Brian and his wife, Notre Dame's building a $44 million indoor facility, okay? And trust me, Brian made, and his wife made the lead gift, and it's a lot greater than 12,000, okay? That's in the span of time. But, you know, that, that's what you need to do. Take it to them. We have like alums of Detroit, let's go to them. And we've done that successfully as time has gone. All right? But listen to what your folks are telling you. We have a football alum, so we're, we're doing, now we're 20 years later, we're, we got to renovate this building. It needs renovation. And we got to raise two and a half million. And have an alum, offensive lineman, that been, been working on for about a year, year and a half. Uh, you know, it's time for you, maybe two grand is most he's given on an annual basis. And uh, Jim, you know, it's time to, uh, he's a vice president at Amway, which is in Grand Rapids, and um, uh, and played golf with him about a year ago. He told me, as we're talking about it, I'm prepping him, priming the pump a little bit. You know, Nancy controls all the money in our house. His wife, Nancy. Okay? Huh? Keep that in mind. Every meeting from there on out, Jim and Nancy. Jim and Nancy. Jim and Nancy. We had dinner uh, a month or so ago, uh, brought in our former president. President Lovers, Christy knows him, and his wife brought in the big gun, double teamed him, and uh, got a tremendously, wonderfully supportive gift, okay? But Nancy had to be a part of it. So listen, Get, you know, start developing that relationship, listen to what they're telling you, and follow their lead. They'll tell, tell your stories. Tell your stories of student athletes. They want to hear about your kids. Tell stories of your student athletes. As the AD, Every time I got up in front of people, any alumni group, I told stories about our student athletes. You know, you can tell about their wonderful academic accomplishments, athletic accomplishments, and then tell a story. They want to hear about one of those kids. They want to hear what the support has done for them. What, what has their support done for your athletics programs? You know what it's done? It's made the experience better for your student athletes. That's what they want to hear. They want to know they're helping make a difference for some student athlete experience. Okay, I'm going to talk about athletic alumni giving here in a minute. But I hear the argument a lot of times, former athletes won't give back. Bull. There's a, there's a psychological thing there that I gave you my sweat, blood, and tears. Why should I give you my money now? And a lot of them are in debt, right? They graduate from all of our schools, which are not on four eyes. And they graduate with debt, okay? I contend, though, you can get them to give back. One, if they had a great experience, use that to your advantage. Say, hey, help keep it going for the current student athletes. And maybe if they didn't, help make it better for today's student athletes. Help make it better for these kids. We went, it took five, six years with our football alumni. We went from, they wanted to get together and drink beer and have a great social time and tell good stories, right? Sound familiar? To, hey guys, you know, this is great, but we need you to help tell your kids. All right? So tell your stories to your kids. Our football alumni association now has two cookouts during August, during preseason training. They have cookout, hot dogs, hamburgers. These guys are cooking and grilling. Our guys, after practice, come through and they engage with them. So we got student athletes, current students, all right, get to know the football alumni so that when they graduate, they're going to be one of them. And the current alumni are getting to know our kids, and they're more apt to help out when it's time to help out. Tell your stories to student athletes, okay? Again, think long term. This is hard work. Hard work, think long term. All right. Working with advancement development offices. Uh, I wish I had all the answers to this. In, in higher ed, this isn't always easy, okay? This can be challenging. In higher ed, people get in their silos. 
And yes, we experienced that. Um, I, as people involved in athletics, it's hard for me, I think it may be hard for you as well, to grapple with, hey, this is all money going to the school to help make the school better in some way, whether it's athletics or something else. Why don't we all just work together on this, right? We can only get everybody to understand that, but most of them aren't involved in athletics, and I don't know if they really get that sometimes. So I don't know that I have any great answers for you except this. I was very fortunate. Grand Valley, we had Kim Schmidt. Kim Schmidt, Associate Director of Alumni Relations. And we were able to really get some things done with alumni giving, athletic alumni giving, because of the work of Kim Schmidt. So on your campus, find your Kim Schmidt would be the answer here. Find that person in your advancement or development office that kind of gets what you're doing. And they understand how hard you work. And they understand you work every weekend. And they understand, yeah, you need their help. Okay, find that person. It's probably not going to be a whole staff. Man, if you get a whole staff in one of those offices that jump on board and help you out, good for you guys, okay? But find your Kim Schmidt on campus. Find that one person that's going to be willing to go to bat for you and do a lot of the work for you that she did for, for me, okay, and help, help us get that done. All right, so this is our version of Karen of your program, okay? We, we call it Alumni Challenge Program. How many of you have done some version of an Alumni Challenge type program? We, bought, we stole from Davidson, I think, okay, probably about five years ago. All right, so now I'm going to go back to, I get to Grand Valley in 1996. We don't really have any alums to speak of. Fast forward another 10, 12 years. Now we're getting close to 50 years and uh, old. And okay, now we got some alums. We got to go after them. We, the institution, need to get our alums engaged back with the institution. So for us in athletics, that was our athletic alums. Okay, start with finding them, finding how to contact them. It's always challenging, right? And that's where Kim Schmidt helped us immensely. And today's role of social media, you should be able to connect with them today. Okay, that's no excuse anymore. It used to be tough, now it's not as tough. You can find them. Somewhere out there, they're out there. Somebody in that sports program knows where that person is. Okay, so find them. So we did it. Uh, the carrot that we used was if uh, in year one, whoever uh, got the most percentage of alumni giving back won $1,000 from the AD. All right, so I had to commit a thousand bucks. And then year two, it was whoever gave the most that year as a percent and whoever improved the most from the previous year. So the first year I gave away a thousand to one program. The second year I gave away a thousand to two different programs. All right, I truly believe that you've got to challenge your alum. I think their DNA, I think this is correct, this worked for us, I think it worked for Karen. They have that competitive DNA, you got to use that to your advantage. Again, it was $1,000. This wasn't some grand, great prize that they were winning, but they wanted to win. And our coaches wanted to win. They're competitive. They wanted to win. Okay, again, we had 20 sports. Okay, however many sports you have, you're going to have some coaches that really buy in, and you're going to have some that probably aren't. Most of them, the basketball guys, like I was one, they don't really want to do it as much, okay? But by and large, uh, use their, your competitive DNA of your alumni and your coaches to your advantage. Okay? So what's the role of the coaches in all this? Uh, let, let me tell you what we did at Grand Valley. This really worked for us. So when I got there, I was lucky. Our football alumni had a football alumni association that was a chapter of the Grand Valley Alumni Association. Okay, these guys started it in the early 80s. Again, it was more of a social group uh, in the beginnings, but they wanted to help the program. These guys' hearts were in the right place, and I'm telling you, our football alums at Grand Valley have been unbelievable, unbelievable to, to our program. And our success, I think, is in part due to what our football alumni continue to be engaged and continue to support in every way. So I got there, and this was already set up. They had bylaws, they had dues, and about 10 years into my uh, time as AD, I thought, there's the model. That's the model. All right? They have a golf outing every summer. All right? They, uh, uh, they, they, they do these cookouts for our team in August. 
All right, the president comes to the football banquet at the end of the year and talks about the Football Alumni Association. They're engaged with, with us. And they had a board, the Football Alumni Association board. And, you know, we made more of the merit. They wanted to be on the board, they were on the board. Okay, eventually, you know, they weren't coming, they faded, we, we'd take them off. But it wasn't a superstructure thing. We just want to support. Let them get involved. So we said, there's our model, let's do that with other sports. So we started track and field. All right, women's basketball, men's basketball, swimming and diving. We went track and field because they got numbers. All right, we've been very good in track and field at Grand Valley. And uh, so that was the second one we started. Okay, and softball, baseball board, volleyball board. I'm looking at Chris our former All-American center who is gonna be our biggest donor at Grand Valley Volleyball <laughs> Association. <Right? laughs> I'm gonna use her competitive DNA. All right. So we set up these boards. As the AD, what's the role of the AD? Help get it organized. Again, I had Kim Schmidt, and we started the Alumni Challenge Program, and we started these boards. And it's, this took now three or four years. This wasn't, we, we couldn't do all of them all at once. Because it was time. It took a significant expenditure of time. But we get, get them in a room twice a year, these boards would meet, and if they're from a distance, we'd Skype them in to the board meeting, okay? and set up a new structure to get them giving and get them to get their teammates to give. And we went after $25, $25. I kept emphasizing, get $25, that's it. I don't care who they are. I don't care if they've got a young family. I don't care if they you know, are busy with starting their careers. I don't care if they have debt, and they do. We all know that. They can afford $25. That's all we wanted. And we wanted to make sure we thank them as much as we did the $250 giver. Okay? Start $25. So we go to track and field. We got a board. And we got in a conference room and we had the screen up and we beamed in. Uh, I can't remember who it was. We beamed one of them in and we were on there and they set dues. And so after this uh, alumni challenge program, I would get a letter or I would get a sheet of paper the number of donors to that sport. So the first year, and by the way, talking about the role of coaches, I went over this in a coaches meeting. I made sure they all understood what was happening here. So the first year in track and field, eight and a half by 11 paper, the names were about two thirds of the page. One gift of three figures. Courtney and Lisa gave $200, I think it was, okay? One gift, the rest of them, $25, $10, $50. Again, we, we didn't care. We were challenging them. The most gifts by percent of their alumni. If you give 10 bucks, great, count it. Boom, count just as much as the $200 gift, all right? By year three, after doing this, year three, that list was two and a half pages long. 50% of the gifts were three figures or more, all right? So the first year, our track coach probably got an additional 675 bucks. All right, how many of you would take? 675 bucks tomorrow. Yes, we would. We all would in our world, right? By year three, significantly more than that. All right, significantly more than that. Had an alumni race, had an indoor meet. We're very fortunate. We have very good facilities, very good indoor facility. Had an alumni race. The little kids would run a lap, and they did it. I was just there at homecoming. They did it at homecoming, all right? So you got to do those things to engage your alums. Bring them back. Let them bring the kids back. It's romper room. It's a madhouse in your facility, so what? Get them engaged, get them to appreciate coming back, okay? So this is what we, 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 we were most concerned with, you know, uh, percent participation and percent change, okay? I believe I'm correct on this, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but nationally, the percent of alumni that give back to their school is 15%. I believe that's correct, 15%. Okay, Grand Valley, again, we're a young school. Our alumni, I think it's about 8% now. And rise, athletic alums, 16%. We got 16% of our athletic alums to give back. Don't worry about the amount. The amount will come. The amount will get better as they progress in their professions, okay? Just get them to get a gift. That's key. And as an AD, thank them every time. Every time. The role of the AD was at that alumni track meet when I was there, I was to go around and thank all of them. Thank them all for being there. And play with their little kids and, and do all that. Right? That's external affairs for the role of the AD. 
right, how much time do I got, Jim? You got about 10 or 12 more minutes. All right, I'll hustle through this. Hiring the right people. Okay, again, I didn't have an athletics development officer at Grand Valley. I was it. It was me. I had to mentally commit, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get these. I went to a lot of board meetings. A lot of them. All right, and by the way, when you get that core group, you bring the head coach. Our head coach knew they had to go to the board meeting. There was two board meetings here. The head coach there, and I think, bring your wish list. What do you need done? Bring it with you. Tell them. We got to tell them. If we're going to ask for support. What is it we need support for? We're in a baseball board meeting one time, and our coach got a list of about eight things. Item four: We want new black helmets, where our colors are black, royal blue, the exact ones. My good rival, Angela Pohl, is wearing here today. Thank you, Angela, for wearing Laker colors. Wearing nice. <laughs> this is orange. This is not <laughs> Saginaw Valley red. I don't stitch a red clothing. That's Saginaw Ferris. I don't stitch a red clothing. <laughs> We're at this baseball board meeting, and he's going down his list, and I am for you. Uh, the guys want black helmets. We, have, we, have, we got black jerseys, and our royal blue helmets and black jerseys didn't look real good. So the guys like black helmets, and... Well, we need about eight of them. They're six, probably about 650 bucks. And it goes up, goes to item five. And oh, oh, Matt Wright from, was living in Florida at the time, catcher for us back in the day. Now in the uh, health uh, service of PT, maybe. I can't remember what Matt's in, but he, he's, we're beaming him in from Florida. He goes, oh, oh, coach, what'd you say? How much was that? He goes, well, eight new helmets cost about 650 bucks. Done. He said, don't worry about it. I'll send you a check tomorrow. Got a cover. Okay. I'm looking at him like, great, move on to number five. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you would take 650 bucks? Just saved his budget, 650 bucks. Guys got black helmets, everybody's happy. And by the way, he, I made sure you let every one of those guys in your team know that's because of Matt Wright, a former catcher here, that you've got those brand new helmets. You've got it. And thank him. And, thank, and I saw him at the homecoming last week. Uh, thanked him again for helping us out with that, right? So, Hiring the right people. So I didn't have an athletic development office, but I did, as I mentioned, first position I hired was an uh, associate AD for marketing and promotions. And um, uh, it was a salary commission job. And, and that was uh, Rob Odieski. Unfortunately, Odie died uh, about five years later in a tragic accident and replaced him with Doug Lipinski. Some of you might know Doug. Doug's uh, heavily involved with NACMA. Uh, uh, Doug is uh, the best in the country, in my opinion, uh, at what he does. Uh, I think at any level, Okay, divisions one, two, three, whatever. Uh, I think Doug's terrific, and he's done a fantastic job for us. So our, in year one, in 1996, we were doing about $12,000 in our first year of sponsorships, all right? And uh, he, he's going to do about a million this year, all right? So that's quite a long-term thinking. 22 years of building relationships and building and driving home deep those relationships with sponsors year after year after year and thanking them and bumping them up every year, okay? So Doug's just done a fantastic job. But when hiring those people, find people that have sales people mentality. They want to win the sale. They're competitive, and they want to get it done. I wanted people that I had to rein in, not people that I had to, let's go, come on, we need more sales. No, I wanted, and Doug and Odie were both the same way. There were times as the AD, my role as the leader was to make sure, you know, these marketing guys didn't go crazy on me and get off the rails and do something that we just couldn't handle or uh, would cause all kinds of issues with game management or whatever it might be, right? But sometimes you have to get creative. You have to go. And I'd say go. Or, or, or one, uh, and you're going to make mistakes, folks. We did. Okay. The classic of Grand Valley was Spartan uh, Stores is one of the leading grocers. They, they own a whole bunch of groceries in the area. They're a big a competitor of Meyer, which is big in the Great Lakes region. So we wanted to get Spartan stores involved. And they wanted to really engage with our students at football and get one of their products in the students' hands. So they remember Spartan stores. So Doug came up with a great idea. We're gonna give them a box of macaroni and cheese. Spartan stores, mac and cheese. What college kid doesn't eat mac and cheese, right? And if you take that box and shake it, it makes a lot of noise. And he envisioned our, all of our students shaking these boxes of mac and cheese like a Bam Bam stick and making all this noise, right? What we feel to take into consideration is our students opening them up, taking them up, and throwing them at the Saginaw Valley players to warm them up, okay? Which, of course, was harmless until it got all over the stands and it started to rain. 
And those little mac and cheese things get really slippery and they really stick in the uh, aluminum seating, okay? Our custodial staff to this day, uh, they had to power wash them and it was a headache. That's going to happen, all right? You want somebody that has ideas like that. Come up with ideas. So find that person. Odie, my first one, student assistant football. I didn't go to some sales organization to hire Odie. Brian Kelly came to me and he says, hey, I think I know what you want to get done here. I got a guy, man. He's always coming up with ideas. And I interviewed me. He was tremendous. Awesome. Okay? I miss him to this day. All right. Last thing, and I know you guys talked about endowments a little bit yesterday, perhaps, and at Bosque, you probably uh, have done this. Uh, so I, I just want to say how important it is in higher education today. Think long term. Think long term. You need money making money. Okay? I don't care how small of dollars you're bringing in, somehow, some way, you've got to set up an endowment fund. And guess what? The people that come after you are probably going to benefit the most from it. Okay? I knew that when we started doing it. I learned that. I, I was a co-chair of our church's capital campaign. And we had an Ed Foundation at our church, uh, Catholic school, K-8, through and we had an endowment at a K-8 school. And the, the, when I was there, it was about two and a half, three million. Shoot, that's kicking off over a hundred grand a year to a K through eight Catholic school. Are you kidding me? It's tremendous, man. I understood the power of money making money then. And uh, so we had an endowment. Here's here's uh, the history of our athletic endowments. Okay, again, 1996, 20 years later. Think long term. Again, they're really benefiting by some things now. Carrie, my successor, I, I know. Uh, is doing a great job, and she's benefiting from it. And the next AD after her is going to really benefit because this just keeps growing, folks. You know, even in the downturn of 2009, they all went backwards. Well, guess what? They've all gotten all that back. But look at this. In 1996, we had five total endowment funds in athletics. Some were scholarship funds. A couple were operations. Okay? We now have 20. All right? And we had this much, and now we have 10 times as much. And the spending of it is... You know, that's how much we're getting distributed now. In 2015, it's probably about 100 grand now of discretionary money for the athletic stuff. Now, some of them are, are restricted during scholarships, right? But some of this is operations money. Football alumni endowment fund. We set that up with our football. And one, I think one of my greatest achievements. We had all the boys, the football alumni board, and Steve Jaswood's house, and had a couple coolers, the bush light going, and I had to sell these guys, guys, we got to start an endowment fund. We have got to do this. We've got to think long term. You know, our football coach, every spring, would go to our football on my board, hat in hand. Uh, we got to get new uniforms. Our laptops are breaking down. I need some more laptops. So the video stuff they do is breaking down. All right, we got we got to solve this longer term. And we go to the football alumni, and we saw it. All right, now, this was difficult. Okay, you can all imagine. They don't think real long term. The football alumni board, right? So I'm selling them on this. I'm trying to get across. And one guy says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do this. And the proceeds will pay for scholarships for football alumni's children. No, no, that's not what we're doing. Okay, we need to help with program. Finally, I, I'm pretty sure it was Gary Evans. God bless Gary Evans. Said, "Hold it, guys, we need to do this." He's right. He knows this, what he's talking about here. We need to do this. So yeah, yeah, all in favor? Yeah, let's, let's do it. All right. So we went. Then the next thing, yeah, in our school, you got to have thirty thousand in the principal before you can spend any money, get any money from it, right? And he says, yeah, and let's wait till we get 100000 before we spend any money. I'm thinking, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you got to run with it, man. So I rolled it. They wanted to do that? Yeah. All right, guys, this won't be easy. Four and a half years later, we're at 92000 And Jim Schaap, who was our longtime president, done a great job for Grand Valley football, sends out a mass email to all our alums. Guys, everybody gives $25. We can get this done. I've given the math. I've done the math. We can get over hundred grand, And within two days, we had over hundred grand. Now, we had a couple guys give us, you know, couple thousand to get us over the hump. Now we're over 100 grand. Hey, today, look at what that is today. $271,000. At 5%, our football coach now has over 10 grand every year. He can buy new laptops for his guys with all the videos and stuff they do. All right, he, all of these endowments, have, like, this is a scholarship. They were very nice to start that when, when, when I retired. This is another scholarship. Look at that, started when, when Jamie died. Uh, unfortunately, about five years ago, uh, another fellowship. This is Kim Schmidt. All right, Steve Workman has been phenomenal. This is a track and field operations endowment fund. Okay, Mike was a young 
Uh, track student athlete for us was our GA. He died in a tragic accident. They started this fund 15 years ago, and look at where that's at. Our track and field coach gets nine grand a year. Just money making money, okay? How many track programs would want 9,000 tomorrow? Yes, they all would, right? <laughs> look at this. So nine and 15, all were started 15 years ago or less. I'm gonna tell you something, I never would've guessed that. I never would've dreamed that. But I was at one of these kinds of things, I can't remember where it was, Ted Leland from Stanford was speaking, the former AD of Stanford, and they had a, what, a billion dollar athletic endowment. All right, I have a billion dollars, no, I'm sorry, right? But they, it only took them 12 years to get there. That got my attention, all right? Now, they got Phil Knight, they got some biggies, right? Stanford, but 12 years and a billion, that's still pretty good, folks, all right? And that took a lot of work, and he talked about making a commitment. So that's one of the things I would say. You've got to commit to it. Think long term. If you're the athletics director, you've got to be that way. Okay? All right, let me stop. We have time for questions? Yeah, questions. Okay, we have time for questions. And, and I'll be here, by the way. I, I don't have to get out of here. We're we'll hurry. <clears throat> when we're done, if you have questions. Bill. Yeah, yeah Tim, yeah. all that money. Can I, can I help stop you? Yes, sir. He had the best line of the day. Okay, we noted, Karen, you have squash teams at <laughs> And you raise some money with squash. And Bill says, South by Mississippi, we raise squash. That's fun. Go ahead. Probably a lot of light. <laughs> yeah, we don't ask squash, we, we raise it. That's right. Anyway, hey, all that money right there, who yeah. decides where it goes, like uh, in a CD or. Uh, you know, yeah. you say you make money. I, I, I agree with that. It's a lot of money. Who decides? Your business person or? Yes. Grand Valley has uh, uh, all of it. I don't say all of it's thrown into one big gigantic pot. Right. Our, our total endowment at the school, uh, maybe $50 million, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't think it's over $100 million. It may be by now, but I don't think so. so. But they manage that whole pot. So it kind of goes in that whole pot, but the gifts go directly. If a gift comes to the Michael Lenz Endowment Fund, the gift goes right there, the total gets added up, and then whatever percent at the end of each year, you know, they all have a formula, right? Three-year average of how much it was, and they can take 4.5% of it. So, yeah, they all did that, yeah. It's just compounding interest. You could, absolutely, compound interest. Bill, our campus has an investment committee. Yeah. Okay. So they decided the investment, but, uh, uh, our foundation holds the money and then disperses it to the, we, we might have 400 different endowments in various areas on campus. 5% a year is what we typically expect uh, to be available to us to spend. Okay. Oh, by the way, I do want to make one other point. Um, I don't think I have, yeah, I do. See this GSU athletic endowment? So I get to Grand Valley in 96, there's about 45 grand in there. I go, what's this? Well, it was an endowment set up for Grand Valley Athletics just to help with the operations of the program. Okay, cool. All right, so at that time, five grand, you know, I was maybe getting 2,000 a year. Nah, we don't need that. Just keep, put, put it back, put it back, keep growing, all right? So uh, there's some D2ADs in here, I know. At, in the spring of every year, we get this check. This small check as a trickle down of the CBS Turner men's basketball, a big contract, right? It's about six or seven grand, I think. It was when I was done. So that we get a check for six or seven grand out of this, right? And when I got there, our president at the time said to me, you know, every year we've been getting that check. It's not enough to really do anything good. I just put it in the GVSU athletic now. So we do that every year. And that's 355000 2015. It's probably 400000 now. <coughs> so it went from, you know, I'm going to make two grand a year off the 4.5% to, oh, okay, I'm going to make eight or nine or 10 grand off that. I, I can use that. Yeah. I, I, I can satisfy something somewhere or some facility or some program to keep that coach at bay, right? <laughs> <laughs> the role of the AD. I wanted, and by the way, uh, with our alumni challenge program, and as, as Karen, you know, athletic alums want to give to their sport, and went right to their sport. They didn't want to give to the Irwin Club, okay, because the AD's going to spend it on football. They want to give to their sport. I didn't care. Absolutely. The track program, I wanted them to give as much as possible to track. 
So if my track coach wasn't pounding my door, wanting this, wanting that, uh, absolutely. And uh, so, yeah, let, I, I didn't care what fun. Look, we had 20 of them. 20. I didn't care. Just give it our, give it to athletics. And uh, so, and then, go ahead. Are we done? Know. Any other questions? Questions. Yeah, yeah. Did you find that as you became more proficient at fundraising that other services at the campus used to provide started going away or they were asking for you for a budget number when they used to not ask you for a budget to count before? Um, yes, there's a, I think I know what you're getting at. If you start to really do a good job at this, they'll start to expect you to keep doing it and then perhaps not support you as much. Or not increase your budget. Okay, exactly. That or take away services that they used to cover. Yeah. Um, that I did not experience. I will say that, and I think we all face this in that place, I faced hurdles from within, all right, and there were some untouchables that we weren't allowed to go seek. Okay, I get that. But then don't come seek ours either. Because we got a few that are big enough number now that. Yeah, I wasn't a happy camper a year ago when I found out they went after one of our big ones for something else. So, um, you know, some of that is you've got to stick up for your folks and, and your efforts and what you've done. And I would always, point, I mean, honestly, well, we couldn't have done what we did without Kim Schmidt. And, man, I, if they would ever take that away from athletics, you know, that would be problematic. Sort of from a resources, maybe more of a budgetary resource standpoint, we've run into this since we've started to establish a couple of new endowments and we have a, a matching challenge from an alum uh, for, rest of, for a scholarship there. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's not the most ethical, we're still recording. Well, but, um, <laughs> what, what we've actually had is in some of our discussions with our alums and we're talking about six-figure gifts or, or, or endowment funds, um, they've actually requested the writing into their gift agreement be that like these dollars don't replace their right, in addition to. Their and so, that's just that little bit. And we have a great relationship with advancement because we have to. Um, and so there's not much competing there as far as like, well, you got this endowment fund now, so we're going to cut the budget. Um, been very intentional with those gift agreements with it. Um, and while it's still very young and early on, we've only gone through a couple budget cycles with those funds. It has helped to say that money is totally a separate pot. And just from a resource of, of dollar standpoint, um, it's, it's allowed us to make sure we're not losing that, that base budget. Let me, let me wrap it up. Last points of emphasis. As an AD, you've got to be committed to this. It's going to be time and energy on your part. But it's, it's to help those kids and those coaches and your programs. Okay? Think long term. Think long term. i got to tell you, two weeks ago, I, I was, uh, I'm on the campaign committee to raise $2.5 for our new football center. And I'm sitting in this meeting, and we're going over... The list, and, what we, and we're talking about, all right, where can we get gifts? 250000 or above. 50000 to two fifty. Gifts of ten to 50000 And I'm just chuckling to myself. We're going to get 5000 per locker. And I'll pay it over five years. Okay? And I'm chuckling because we didn't, the biggest gift we got was 5000 my first four years. And we're talking about these numbers? I thought, man, this, this, it was a good feeling. It really was. So that's where the rewards would come in for you with your time and energy is when you know those kids and uh, those programs are going to benefit from it. So again, I'll be here when, I, when we wrap up. I'm going to hang around a while. If you want to talk, you go ahead and talk. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.